Boa tarde a todos e sejam bem-vindos. É um grande prazer aqui para estar aqui hoje e dar as boas-vindas à nossa convidada especial, Tiffany Derry. Meu nome é Kevin Brasnahan e sou adido cultural aqui no Consulado Geral dos Estados Unidos, no Rio de Janeiro. Antes de começar, algumas dicas para facilitar este encontro. Os microfones de vocês estão desligados. Durante a mostra e a fala uh, do, do Tiffany, vocês podem usar a caixa das perguntas aqui embaixo para colocar perguntas para ela. O Douglas e eu vamos moderar as perguntas durante a sessão. Este evento está sendo gravado. Hoje temos, legenda, temos legendas e interpretação disponíveis. Se as legendas ainda não aparecer, apareceram em sua tela, pode clicar em legendas ou CC embaixo para as ativar. Também pode acessar interpretação em português por clicar embaixo no globo, uh, o globo, o ícone globo embaixo. Originalmente planejamos este, project, uh, este programa para fevereiro, durante o mês da história negra, para comemorar e celebrar as contribuições da cultura afro-americana e culinária à culinária dos Estados Unidos. A comunidade afro-americana é uma parte integrante e importante da cultura dos Estados Unidos. Não há nenhum aspecto da cultura dos Estados Unidos que não tenha sido afetado e melhorado sem a participação de afro-americanos. Basta pensar nisso. Música, ciência, matemática, tecnologia, comida, artes, esportes e muitas outras áreas não seriam as mesmas sem a participação diversificada e ampla da comunidade afro-americana. Diversidade e inclusão, e também destacando as contribuições de diversos americanos e americanas, são importantes para os Estados Unidos e a missão dos Estados Unidos no Brasil. Estou orgulhoso do trabalho que, no, que nossa equipe fez para construir uma missão dos Estados Unidos mais inclusiva. Mas sabemos que isso é apenas um começo e, e precisamos investir e fazer comprometimento de longo prazo para realmente ter uma missão e um país que valorize diversidade e inclusão. E por isso que estou orgulhoso de tra trabalho que de trabalho que fizemos durante a mesa da história e mais também que estamos fazendo agora durante, durante a mesa da história da mulher para destacar os americanos e americanas que tornam os Estados Unidos melhor, mais diversificado e mais justo. Agora, quero apresentar nossos participantes. O Douglas Buster é um empreendedor local do Rio de Janeiro, consultor de empresas locais. Ele ajuda restaurantes e cozinheiros para melhorar suas comunicações e fazer estratégicas em mídias sociais. Ele é conhecido como Marketing do Chef no Instagram e ele também é amigo do Consulado Geral, a Missão Diplomática, e, e participou no ano passado no intercâmbio virtual dos Estados Unidos International Visitor Leadership Program, enfocado em empreendedorismo social. Agora, é, mi, é meu prazer apresentar nossa convidada especial, Tiffany Derry. A senhora Derry é mais eh, do que uma chef. Ela também é empresária, uma líder em sua comunidade e um modelo para aqueles ao seu redor. Atualmente, ela tem três restaurantes, Roots Chicken Shack, na cidade de Plano, Texas e Austin, Texas, que serve duck fat fried chicken, e Roots Southern Table, que vai abrir no segundo trimestre deste ano. Eu tenho, de, tenho que confessar que eu, eu, eu era super fã dela quando ela competiu no Top Chef nos Estados Unidos anos atrás. Ela terminou entre os cinco fina, finalistas naquela, naquela temporada e novamente no Top Chef All Stars. Mas acho que o, o que é mais importante é que ela foi classificada como fan favorite, favorita da, dos fãs. Temos muita sorte de ter Tiffany Derry aqui conosco virtualmente. Estamos muito 
entusiasmados con el, el programa DELA y no apenas por una nueva receta de, de frango do estilo sur y rolinhos, mas también por ouvir más sobre su historia de inspiración como emprendedora y el último trabajo que ella fez por su comunidad en Texas. Welcome, Douglas. Welcome, Tiffany. Tiffany, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. And thank you to the counselor and everyone who is on the call. Thanks for joining in. Um, I hope that today we are going to have some fun. You will get some questions answered and you will learn a little bit more about Southern cuisine and about American, American cuisine altogether. <laughs> so before we go too far, I really want to share with you a video so that you can understand a little bit about my life and where I have come from.
Beauty Dairy, and I'm gonna show you a crazy way to make apple crisp that's far too common. A couple of these don't look too good, so we just toss them. Next, flour, sugar, whoops, guess can't use that anymore. You see where I'm headed? Each day, 40% of our food is tossed away, while one in six Americans face hunger. That's crazy. Join the movement with chefs across the country just one day a week. Plan, get creative, repurpose, compost, be the change. Waste Not Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, I hope that you all were able to get a little bit of a glance into sort of the life. Uh, and I'm going to go into much more detail of my upbringing and the restaurants and the TV shows and some of the people I've cooked for and all of that good stuff. But before we do that, we want to get into the recipe. I have a very special recipe I want to share with you. It is Southern chicken and dumplings. And it is this stewed chicken, essentially, a stewed chicken that cooks down with dumplings. We're gonna make that out of biscuits. So we're gonna make a biscuit dough for that. And then we're gonna finish up the sauce with a little bit of garnish. And I laugh because this is not my mother's chicken and dumplings, meaning it does not look like my mother's, but it definitely, tastes like it. So oftentimes we will elevate our food a little bit more, especially for the restaurant, but that same flavor you're gonna get. So the first thing that we're gonna do is take our chicken. We take a whole chicken, put it in a pot with some water, some vegetables like onions, carrots, celery, some spices in there. Uh, we have some celery seed and chili powder, paprika, cumin, garlic, lots of love, lots of flavor, and allow that to cook until the chicken is fully cooked. At that point, I take the broth out, shred the chicken, and make sure I save all of that flavor, okay? One of the other things we're going to do is get started on the dumplings. So it's important to know I am a Southern girl. And what that means is that I am from the Southern area of the state. Um, often characterize the South. The South has tons of flavor. We believe in letting our food sing and making sure that things have some taste, right? So we don't really do bland where I'm from. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is make some biscuits. And what that requires is a little bit of flour. And Douglas, if you have questions, or anyone else has questions, feel free to jump right on in. But I'm just gonna show you how to do the dough. So all dry ingredients, no different than any other dough that you wanna make. So I have some baking powder, some flour, and some salt. We're gonna mix these up, all dry ingredients together. And then we're gonna cut in a little bit of shortening. Here I'm using vegetable shortening, but you could use butter if you wanted to as well. Works the same. I've just found the shortening gives me a little bit of a little fluffier dough. Tiffany, just for one second, I want to um, remind people that I just put the, a link to the recipe in the chat box. So if people want to follow along, they can, uh, they can follow along that way. Perfect. Thank you. So when I say cut, what I mean is I'm taking my fork and I'm pushing it into the flour. I'm pushing the shortening into the flour so that basically all of the fat will go into the flour and will create the texture of soft like pillows. Almost like if you were having a gnocchi or something like that. That's the texture that you will end up with once you're done. A dumpling should never be heavy. It should always be light. <laughs> so we're going to just kind of mix that together. And while I'm doing that, I'll remind you the chicken. I use that whole chicken. It's been cooked already in the water and the aromatics. And we've shredded that and we'll put that to the side. So growing up, my family, my mom had 11 brothers and sisters. We're technically 10 brothers and sisters with 11 of them. And my grandmother was a single parent. She cooked a whole lot. Um, and we were from an area called Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They ended up moving to Texas. Um, 
at an age when my mom was much older and they really came with all the flavors and all the things that they would cook in Louisiana. So dumplings is sort of one of those things because we make a lot of biscuits. And when you make biscuits, which is what we're doing now, when you make biscuits, you have a lot of scraps. You have a lot of like in pieces and they would take, after you make biscuits, you put that all your dough in the fridge and whatever was left over on the next day, you would stew chicken and dumplings. So you take that whole chicken and stew all of that uh, dumpling dough in the inside of it. So my family, really, they're the ones who got me into cooking because I just love to eat when I was younger. <laughs> As you can see in the video, me stuffing the cake down my face. <laughs> okay. We so, had one question here, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, uh, somebody was asking about um, whether you use um, garlic in the dumplings, but I think maybe garlic is in the, the chicken part of it. Is that right? That's correct. So the, the garlic is in the flavor of the chicken broth. So that water that we cook the whole chicken in, we put all of our seasonings in that. The actual dumpling should be somewhat neutral because we're going to cook it inside of that broth and it takes on all that flavor. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then so actually what, we had one, sorry, yeah. one other question about what is shortening exactly? It's, <laughs> I, I know we have it here in Brazil, but I think it's a different, it goes by a different name. So it's a lard, it's a fat, um, where they basically extruded all of the, the oil from vegetable. Um, we oftentimes, when we call it lard, we're talking about pork. So that's the pork fat, but this one is a vegetable. In my household, it would be whatever they had. So it could be duck fat, it could be beef fat, it could be pork fat, whatever congealed fat that they had is what they would use because you can't do this with liquid oil. It will turn um, a little bit of the dumpling would turn into a, a mess. It wouldn't hold up. The biscuit wouldn't hold together. So if the oil is not right, if it's not a congeal, um, then it won't work out for you. But butter works as well. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you sort of the texture that you're going to get. And again, it looks kind of like fine sand once you've put in your shortening into your flour. From that, we're going to add in our milk. And we're just going to mix it up until it comes together. Once it comes together, we're going to take it out of the bowl and get it on our surface. So this part, we don't want to overdo and we don't want to mix too much. We just want to do it until it comes together and we'll knead it here a little bit later. So I've got a little flour. All that good dough. And there's so many uses for this. I mean, obviously we're putting it in the chicken here, but if I was to go from this right here to a natural state, I could make circles or I could cut large pieces and make biscuits and bake it in the oven versus, as, versus you know, steaming them essentially is what we're going to be doing. Make sense? So this is a two for one recipe. <laughs> I think uh, someone else had a question here about, I, um, could they use lactose free milk? You can, um, you just need to use a milk that has some fat. Um, so whether, whether that is from plant fat or plant oils, um, you just need a little bit. So yes, you can. Okay, so here it is. I have my dough. I'll put a little bit of flour. And I'm going, I'm going to roll it out. I have my rolling pin and I'm going to roll it out just so that I can work with it. Growing up, this is sort of one of those dishes where <laughs> you roll it how thin you like it. So certain households would have thicker dumplings and my mom would go, mm -mm, that's not right. <laughs> and then certain households would have a thinner, kind of like how we did. A lot of Southerners would do more thin and sort of one of those ways we knew you weren't from the South is if your dumplings were this thick. You're like, that's not the Southern way. So when I say Southern, what we're talking about is really the region of, again, the Southern part of the United States. 
And we have what is called soul food and Southern food. Um, one interesting fact is that soul food is Southern food, but Southern food isn't always soul food. And what I mean by that is soul food is an ethnic cuisine. It was cooked by Blacks. It was sort of brought down when the slaves came and they merged with whatever the area they were in and started to cook from that land, right? And so that is kind of what created soul food, was always something passed down. So soul food would be recipes, generations of cooks that have influenced the way you cook from your parents that they pass down certain things to you. Southern could be anybody living in the South creating food based off of the Southern region, which had a very different way of cooking as well. A lot of braised items, a lot of items that cooked down um, and rice was a big part of the Southern cuisine. In fact, the town I was raised in was, is, not was, is a rice city. So they have rice fields. <laughs> that, that's uh Beaumont is that is that what you said Beaumont Texas okay. yes yes okay. I, go ahead go ahead sorry no I'm just rolling the dough out um I know that you can't see it all the way but I'll show you how thin I like it so all I'm going to do is go through and just make some squares don't worry about those edges if the edges aren't perfect we're still going to pop it in that broth and it's still going to be as delicious <laughs> so i am making sort of strips from those strips you will make squares so that's sort of what we're looking for some squares to be able to do and that is what will go in our broth one one question um someone had a, as a following up if they were to use butter instead of um shortening should it be melted or should it be cold or? It should be cold. We need whatever we use to make the biscuit. The fat has to be all the way. When I say congealed, I mean, it is not runny. So we can't use, oil just doesn't work very well. So better to use a cold butter, stiff butter that is straight from the refrigerator or even freezing the butter and then putting it in so we don't want to overwork the dough. Make sense? All right, so here we have it. I have all of my dumplings that we have created. And this is what I will drop in. Thank you so much. We're gonna drop that in. So now my dumplings are done. My chicken is done. Um, and soon after, it's time to make the sauce, which is my favorite part, because this is sort of the flavor, right? Like everything about Southern cuisine is flavor. Sometimes people think of it as spice, and in terms of spice, they're, they're saying heat. And so there is a little bit of a miscommunication of uh, that Southern food is spicy. Now, there are places and there are families who like spice. And um, they will do it through heat, cayenne, chili peppers. We have um, a Tabasco chili that is very, very prevalent in um, the South. And you'll find there is even a hot sauce made from that Tabasco. It's probably one of the most popular, especially here in the South. So it's fun and delicious flavor. Do you guys have um, spices through vinegar with hot sauce and things like that? Here in Brazil, yes, um, there's some more um, vinegar-based ones. Um, Douglas, I don't want to cut you off. Please, go ahead. No, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, can you hear me, Tiffany? Can, yes. Hey, Douglas. Uh, hi, hi. I tried your, your recipe, but recipe? It's, it, it's very different uh, the way I, I'm watching you now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very different because I, I didn't know uh how it was so i googled to to see um what is this and most of the the image i saw uh it was a bowl not just like yours so can you tell me how uh, where i 
I made this mistake? Yes, so dumpling is universal. Um, a Southern dumpling is a little bit different. So it's funny because sometimes dumpling just means any kind of flour mixture. Um, Jewish will do like matzo balls, right? So you have this big, the, a lot of Germans do a large bowl, ball of dough that gets cooked in. So in the South, it was considered to be more scraps. So you would have pieces from rolling out biscuit dough and you would use those pieces of it. So it wouldn't be balls or you, you wouldn't have large chunks of it like that. So it's one of the ways that we say, <laughs> that when we see balls of dumplings like that, we go, that person's not from the South. <laughs> Uh, and now you know I'm not from the South because my, <laughs> my dumping was just, I don't know if you're watching my video, but it's um, oh. I, the ball. <laughs> I made a, a ball. Yeah. You, Did so, you roll it out at all or you just formed them? Uh, first I rolled it, but then I, <laughs> I saw uh, uh, a ball, then I realized it. So. I had to make a ball, not uh, a piece, just like you. But it's very, very uh, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas, it, it looks like a pau de queijo, like a yes, little. Uh, here in Brazil, we have little uh, cheese bread, uh, oh, yes. and, and uh, for breakfast, and it looks just like that. It looks delicious. <laughs> well, Douglas, it's completely fine. It's not you know, the way we do it, but the flavor will still be there, right? So as long as the flavor's there. You must to come here in the, the Rio because I really want to try this, this one. Because <laughs> mine, it's not like yours. So I really want to, to taste yours. Yes, and I want to cook it for you. Okay, so I'm going to keep going with this recipe where we're going to make our sauce. So we have made the chicken broth along with the chicken, shredded that up, kept it separate. Now, what we're gonna do is refine the sauce. In my family's house, this dish would be one big pot. It wouldn't be multiple layers of textures and flavors and colors and all of that. Me being the chef and wanting to um, really sort of make the dish stand out, for the restaurant, we would have this a little different. So I'm showing you the version we would do in the restaurant where we would have folks come and spend a little bit of money. <laughs> so we say, you know, maybe the normal chicken and dumplings that my mom would make, maybe we get $8 for it, a bowl. You know, when we go to the restaurant and we make the separation of all the flavors, maybe now we'll get about $25 a bowl. So just a little bit of a higher end flair to the dish with all the same flavors. We have to keep the integrity of the dish and that is most important. So I have flour and I have butter. I have made what I call a blonde roux. And the blonde roux again is flour and butter. It could be flour and oil. And you just allow that to cook for really briefly no more than three minutes. Make sure that there is no clumps and just add in your liquid. At this point, we're gonna add in a whisk and I'm gonna break this up a little bit so that I can make sure that it all cooks together. And Tiffany, the, the, the liquid that you just added was the liquid that you had left over from um, cooking the chicken, right? Correct, so I took the broth from, I took the broth from the chicken and I measured that out and I put that inside of here along with a cup of the dumpling broth because the dumpling broth has some of the starch to help it thicken naturally as well. And that has a little bit of a different flavor. Where? Okay, so we are gonna thicken our broth a little bit. Let this cook for at least five to 10 minutes. Um, and we're just gonna get the flavor we're looking for. 
So what we're looking for is the flour to cook off so you don't have that flavor. And some of the seasoning, remember all of those spices that I put inside of the broth when we were making the chicken that I was talking about, all of that is gonna be in here as well. So it will thicken once it comes up to a boil. So we have to bring it up to a boil and then we reduce the liquid a little bit. And we had one more question from, um, from Joao Guillermo Mesquita about whether this is a, a kind of similar to a velote. Is that, is that how I say it? Velote yes, sauce? Velote. Yes, yes. Um, so a velote is exactly what you're, you're making, um, which is a roux and liquid mixed together. And typically you would have, um, you know, some type of aromatic, but since we've already done the aromatic, by having that like all the flavors that were in the broth, now we're just kind of refining it. But yes, you're exactly right. We have our, our chef students on, I love it. <laughs> so a couple of places that um, I'll tell you that the career has taken me. And uh, while this is coming to, or at a boil, I'm gonna bring it down to simmer to let that flour cook off. Um, I have enjoyed Southern food all my life, but I can tell you when I was younger in my culinary career, I didn't always cook it when I was in restaurants. A part of me was made to believe not only what I thought, but what people would tell me was that, you know, Southern food and soul food, they were unhealthy. That's not what people want to pay money for. That's not what you cook. So in order to be a great chef, you have to learn French food and Italian food and Asian food. And so I spent a lot of time traveling the country, learning how to cook other cuisines. Um, and one day I just missed my food, the foods that I grew up eating, the foods that I loved. And um, I don't know, something happened in, in me that the only thing I wanted to do was share my cuisine with the world. And when I became very comfortable in my own skin and cooking the food that I love, um, I started to get a lot more notoriety, you know, even on the TV show, when I did Top Chef, I started off sort of trying to figure it out, right? You know, cooking what I think they wanted to taste or what people say they like a whole lot. And at the end of the day, the foods that seemed to do the best were foods that I loved, that I had a connection to, you know, it was a deeper sense of, of cooking rather than just something I learned, right? When you're tied to a dish, there, there's beauty in it. And so um, Southern food is something that I, I've had the opportunity to show people all around the world. I do some events with uh, the U.S. Embassy in India, and we had a fantastic event. Uh, they had never had mac and cheese, so I had to do it. <laughs> so we made mac and cheese. Um, there was even an event that we fried some chicken. They weren't, they, you know, had never had the spices. Um, and then there were other dishes that we did with them where, you know, I did a grilled avocado with a lot of like collard greens and mustard greens, which are very much in our region. A lot of the green vegetables we've had. Um, recently, last year, February, I went to France and we did some um, dinners out there. And, you know, the more you travel and the more you connect with people through food, you realize that you're not very different and that we all have this connection of food and food almost directly ties to where we've come from or where our people have come from. And when you get a chance to talk about that, it's just beautiful and it's wonderful. And so I've really enjoyed that. Um, I've even had the opportunity to cook in the White House twice um, under President Barack Obama, where we made some Southern food for guests during Black History Month and another time where we were just cooking. And some of the dishes that he wanted were some of my, my mom's favorites as well, <laughs> which was her gumbo. And gumbo in Southern food is like, that's religious, you know, you don't, First off, every family makes it, everyone makes it different, everyone wants to tell you how to make it, 
Um, and I truly believe no different than everyone else that my mom makes it the best. Uh, <laughs> and it's one of those things on menus. If it's ever there, I have to have it. I'm going to order it. And majority of the time, it's not very good. So um, I made gumbo at the White House and they absolutely loved it. Like I knew they would, which was pretty cool for me. <laughs> I also, maybe two years ago, I went and um, I cooked for Oprah Winfrey for a month and that was wonderful. Um, Miss Winfrey in Hawaii um, with some other friends of mine and um, we cooked three meals a day, different regions of food, different cultures every single day were represented and that was one of those times where it paid off that I learned so many different types of ways of cooking because you cannot every day for a month, three days, out of, uh, three meals out of the day. <laughs> One thing I saw you do uh, when you were uh, finalizing the uh, dumpling um, uh, recipe is you took the flour off the counter and wiped it into the bowl. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, food waste and how you work to um, to reuse or, or use ingredients to the most to the to the most that you can. Yes, you know a big part of what I do outside of social justice inequality equality and all of that is food waste. I am a ambassador uh, for the James Beard Foundation, and I represent sort of how we can make some changes. Um, there was a video that you were shown where you know we were um, being dramatic, right? But it was the idea that. When we're making something, we drop a little bit on there, you know, a little extra flour, a little extra sugar. And I said, oh, the apples, they're a little spotted. You have people that throw them away. And especially in this country, um, people are just a little wasteful. And, you know, if it's not a perfect tomato, then they don't want it, you know. And it's caused a huge problem within our system. We have some systems set up now and people are making progress, but we have to be conscious in everything that we do to create a better system so that the next generation doesn't think about, you know, throwing away something that doesn't look perfect, right? Um, and we have waste from the farm to, um, you know, the diesel being used to get it to the locations, um, grocery stores, restaurants, household, There's waste in every aspect of it. Some of the largest waste um, usually happens on the farm. And we talk about the fact that we actually grow enough food for all of us. Um, we just don't get it to the right people and how they say there's connections, obviously, to enough food being grown. And if we actually took care of everyone, we would all be good. So, you know, it also has to do with the people, the consumers, not looking for everything to be perfect. The reason that the farm has to throw away those tomatoes that aren't perfect is because when they take it to the stores or to the markets, they don't buy them. So, you know, there is, and they don't want to harvest something that they can't sell because number one, the wages are already so hard to do. Second, picking all of these things that no one's going to buy. Third, um, diesel and having to transport all of this to the proper locations. Um, for them not to use. And so, you know, one of the things I think we have to do better is take more care of our farmers. Um, our farmers are getting older and our, the kids who are coming up are not wanting to take over the farms or we're not having enough people going into farming. And so those are some of the things that I, I stand for and I really fight hard for. I go to DC and I lobby for food policy and for better policies to be done. Um, I was a part of the farm bill for 2013, and uh, now it's coming back around, um, and it's almost time to do another. And so those are things that some of us, we have to be a little bit more conscientious of the choices that we make. Um, and also, we have to talk about it. You know, the one thing I hear is, oh, I don't do waste. I don't throw much away. Uh, well, you know, it's not just you, and sometimes you do when you're not thinking about it, right? For restaurants. Um, sometimes we need to improve our portion size. Sometimes guests aren't eating all of that. Um, and then if we have to take it home and there's plastic and styrofoam and all of these things involved. Um, so we just have to make sure that we think about waste from the onset, meaning I got a carrot, a full carrot that came out of the ground. I paid all of this money 
to buy this carrot, right? This beautiful carrot with its beautiful leaves. Person gets it home, they cut off the leaves and they throw that away. They take and they peel the carrot and they throw that away. Then they wanna chop the perfect carrot right into the perfect pieces. And as much as I understand about perfect cuts, I also understand that I have to utilize that full piece. Those peelings, though they may have a little bit of a bitter flavor, let's use that inside of making stocks. So for instance, the sauce we made today, the broth, we use the ends and pieces in there. We can chop up all of the leaves from the top and use that in lettuce. We can make churi, chimichurris out of it, salsas out of it, garnish out of it. You know, there's so many different things that we can do when we start thinking about it from the onset of it. You got me over here talking and now the sauce is getting thicker. Looks good. All right. So actually sauce is ready. So I'm going to show you how we put this together. I'm going to add in a little bit of vinegar. And with the vinegar, all that does is sort of pick the flavor up. So it's not meant for you to taste per se vinegar. What you will do in your mouth is it sort of mimics salt. So I work a lot with the diabetes community. And one of the things I say, instead of adding salt first, add a touch of acid, a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of lemon or lime, and it often just picks up the flavor and you often don't need the salt. So here we go. I have some chives and I love that sort of onion, a little bit peppery flavor. Yum. And I'm going to set that aside. Thank you. Mm. Now that's the goodness right there. All of those flavors that we use from the broth that has cooked down into that sauce, now it's ready to be plated. I'm gonna take a bowl, I'm gonna grab my dumplings. And Douglas, this is what our dumplings look like once um, they have cooked up over here. So they are a little thinner. And if you want, you can also do bigger. For instance, like this one is a nice size and it's cooked and airy and soft. We're going to add in some chicken. I'm very jealous about the <laughs> Yes, for sure. But, but my, my sauce is right. <laughs> yes, and that's what matters. <laughs> my sauce was, my sauce and my chicken was very, very right. So, <laughs> uh, um, two points. I love deal. Three. So, so, <laughs> so I have some dill, I have my celery, and some carrots, and my dumplings, and I'm gonna add a touch of salt. Doesn't need much and just a touch of pepper. And so what we're gonna do, our mixture. And so we do this per order at the restaurant. And then we would have the chicken with the vegetables and the dumplings in the very center. And the, the broth and the flavor should almost feel like it's been cooking all day. You know, that depth of flavor. Even though we're making it look a little bit better, um, you know, in presentation, it should taste, it should remind me of things my mom and my grandmother would make. From here, I'm going to add on a little bit of fresh dill for garnish. And this is the same deal that I was chopping up that I have chopped over here. I just saved a few sprigs and I love to eat the deal. So this is an edible garnish because we don't put garnish that we can't eat on our plate. Everything must have a use. Then if we are at the restaurant, when we come to your table, we would just pour that sauce on. 
Mm. And that, my friends, is Southern chicken and dumplings. Do you see the dumpling and the chicken? <laughs> let me see. Let me see. All I'm saying is, if you haven't made it, you definitely want to make it. It is delicious. It has some flavor. If you want it to be a little spicier, you can always add in a touch of cayenne or a touch of chilies, any of those things if you want to pick up the spice. But it should be delicious, and we would often have it some type of vegetable salad. Could be a green salad, could be pickled cucumbers and tomatoes with sliced red onion, things like that, but something to balance out the dumpling and the richness of the broth. Any other questions? Well, first I want to say thank you. And I know that Douglas has a question, so I'll let him go first. Okay. Uh, Tiffany, um, I have a, a couple questions for you. Um, when I Googled your name, I, I realized it, how famous you are uh, in the US. Um, <laughs> but, but first, I, I, I would like to know how tough is being um, a black woman chief uh, when, well, nowadays? You know, it is a little bit easier now, I would say. I won't say it's easy. My first job, Douglas, I was denied to go in the kitchen. I showed up at a restaurant. I told them that I wanted to be a cook, and they told me that no women were allowed in the kitchen. So um, in that, that might have been the first time that I really can remember um, being judged mainly because I'm a woman. Um, then the more I find out about the restaurant industry and in that it is considered a man's kitchen, um, even though women have been cooking for generations, whatever, um, you know, it always seemed so strange to me. Um, and I love that there are more chefs, more women chefs now who are being recognized um, because I never, the whole time of my culinary school, high school, I never knew one black woman chef. Like I never knew either. I knew, never knew a black chef and I never knew a woman black chef. I remember um, when I finally found the one guy who I worked with, um, he told me, you have two strikes against you. You're a woman and you're black. So you have to be better than everyone else. And you have to have tough shoulders. And I remember um, reading a script that says, be so good, they can't deny you. And it is something that I live by. Um, if I don't know something, I study it. If I don't know it, I figure it out. Um, but when you are so good, they can't just not see you. You stick out in all the right reasons. And so um, I think that it's getting better. And there are many women that are leading the charge. And I hope that there are other Black young chefs who see sort of what I have going on. Um, because we're still very rare. I don't know many Black chefs. I don't know many women Black chefs who own their restaurants. I know a lot of caterers. I know a lot of personal chefs, but I don't know them in the restaurant. And so I um, hope to be an example that it can happen. And if it's what you want, go for it. Do it. Don't let what you see keep you from doing what you want to do. And that reality is not just uh, there. Here in Brazil, it's just, just the same, wow. unfortunately. Um, um, a little bit more about your graduation. You, you studied at um, Art Institute of Houston, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if we went back um, in 2003, um, would you think that you became um, an international chef just like you are now? Maybe not an international chef, but I always felt like I wanted to do something TV wise as well, you know, and maybe it was just a dream. Um, but in my head, I felt like it was going to happen one day. 
I didn't know how, I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I didn't have any steps to get there, but it was just something that I believed. Um, and I can tell you that the shows that I have been on, all of those shows came to me. I did not go and try out for them. And I believe there is something to being sometimes in the right place at the right time. Um, but there's also something to working hard, making a name for yourself and being so good, they can't deny you. Cool, cool, cool. And talking about the Top Chef, uh, after you finish this, this, so first, how was, was this experience for you? Uh, <laughs> I have a, another question, but uh, first, tell us a little more about, about um, how this experience um, changed your life, how, how, how important it was for you, for you being in the show, not just this, but uh, all, all the shows that you, you participate later. Yes. So to go back, I'll tell you again that I didn't try out. And what I mean for that was I was cooking in my kitchen and in the restaurant and I got a call and they said, hey, Top Chef wants to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, Top <laughs> Chef knows who I am, sure. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> it was them. And um, I ended up getting the phone because I thought it was someone playing. And I was like, hello, you know, with a little bit of attitude. And they said, this is Top Chef. And we would love for you to be on the show. Now I'm thinking, how did you know who I was, you know, like this national show, um, but my name came up a couple of times. I had seen the show, but I, I didn't watch it religiously. I didn't watch it all the time um, because I was working a, a lot then. And so um, I told them when they called that I wasn't interested in being um, on the show because I would have to be gone for a few months. And I would have to live with people and I wouldn't have my phone or be able to be, you know, with the restaurant. So they told me well, you can win, you know, I think it was $200,000 or something. And I, I've never seen money like that in my life. So I said, okay, where do I sign up? <laughs> um, it was a lot of changing. I had no clue that life would change so quick. But I also didn't have anybody to tell me um, anything different. I just wanted to make sure that I represent myself well. And I also wanted to represent my family well. And so once I got into the groove of letting the nervous energy out, um, I seemed to do rather well and people connected with me. So it, It worked out pretty good, but I had no clue when I was doing it, you know, how it would be. Cool, cool. And a little more about your entrepreneurial experience. Um, was uh, Private House Social your first uh, business? I, 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 I Google and I saw this name, but I don't know if that, if that restaurant was your first. It was my first restaurant. I had another at a company where I did catering and other things out of, um, and that would have been my first company, but Private Social was my first restaurant. And um, when we opened, I mean, we had people from all over eating there and it was after the Top Chef show. So people knew who I was and when they would come to Texas and Dallas, they would come to the restaurant. Um, we received many awards, best new restaurant, and it was something different. So we weren't considered a Southern restaurant, but there was a lot of Southern influence. And it was the first time in my life, I've been cooking now for 23 years, 22 years. Um, it was the first time that I put fried chicken on the menu and that just took off. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, and what advice would you give for our audience here? Um, I think we have many Tiffany's uh, in 2003 uh, here. Uh, so um, what would be nice to hear uh, in the past, uh, something that you uh, could tell for, for us here now? Yeah, 
yeah, you know, if um, I was young and I would be telling myself to definitely keep going um, and that the sacrifice will be worth it. Um, but first, learn all you can. And I think the, the learning part is so important. Um, I tell my younger cooks now that you can go from job to job. You can change careers. You can do a lot of different things, but the knowledge that stays with you. So if you get fired, your knowledge comes with you and you take that everywhere you go. So learn from every situation, from every restaurant, from whatever you can, whether that's your grandmother, you know, those recipes, that is the jewels, mm -hmm. the family traditions that carry on. And I think that is just very special. So knowledge is important. Cool. Thank you very much. I, I will not show you my, my dish. It's, it's here, but I will not show you because it's not just like war, but I, I, I want to try it again after, <laughs> after now. Now I know how, how I can make the, the traditional one. So yes. uh, I, I, I'm gonna eat this. But uh, me and my family, but later I I want to to remake your 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 dish to perfect to make it right. Okay? And and also too Douglas in like my mom's house, it is a one pot meal. So the chicken and you know how you cook the chicken and you took it out, you shredded the chicken, broke it up, right, and then you had the liquid. The liquid and the chicken will go back in the pot. And then you would put those dumplings in the pot, let that come up. Um, if the dumpling doesn't make it thick enough, you add the root to that and get it going. So everything just goes in the pot. So you don't have the separation. Now, if you're feeling fancy, <laughs> then definitely, you know, that's how it would be in the restaurant. But if you're at home and you just want to make it in one pot, it's all the same flavors. They just go in to the same pot. It's so easy. Thank you very much. Gavin, go on. I would say, Douglas, but I, I'm on your side. So for when I cook, and I am a big fan of Top Chef, when I cook, um, my presentation is not so great. But I do focus on the taste, and the taste is important. Most but important. For me, the most important thing, right? <laughs> um, there are a couple more questions in the uh, that we've had. Actually, there's a lot of super fans on this um, that are asking really uh, uh, specific questions about your background. But one person. Um, just wanted, I, I think you've already talked about the, the, whether you were under a lot of pressure and, um, during, uh, Top Chef. And then, uh, this is from Chris Borges, who, um, I think he studied abroad in Michigan or it looks like Michigan. Um, and he said that his host mom used to make chicken and dumplings and this is all taking him back. So, um, I, I guess may, if you could talk a little bit about the pressure, um, on, of cooking competitions or, uh, specifically Top Chef, how you dealt with that. Sure, you know, <laughs> my dad, he has a saying about me. He says, Tiff, she's like a duck. On top of the water, she seems cool, calm, and collected. Underneath, she's down there paddling. Um, and <laughs> I find that to be true. So oftentimes people say they can't see that I am stressed. But Top Chef, whoo, I had never dealt with the type of not just stress, but you are attempting to be so perfect in situations where perfection will never be. <laughs> you, don't, you don't determine what you're cooking most of the time. You don't determine the time that it will take for you to cook it. You don't determine what the grocery store would have. So coming from Texas, I remember there's an episode where I make chicken, I'm, I'm not, don't, don't look at that episode. Um, <laughs> let's look at the episode where I made some tamales, okay? I made tamales and in Texas, Mexican food is very, very prevalent. You go to most of the stores, you find masa, you find um, hus. I was in DC. And DC apparently, maybe it's not as many Mexican food, I don't know. But they had no masa and they had no husk. But Tiffany, you know, when I get this thought in my head, I'm like, I am making tamales. I, am, I came on the, rest, on the restaurant saying I'm gonna make it. 
So the one thing to remember is that when you do Top Chef, you can't bring recipes and you can't have your computer, you don't have your phone, you don't have any of those things. So you have only the recipes that you have in your head. So it's one of those reasons why we never want to do pastries or desserts because Sometimes we can't remember the measurements. So that's why all the chefs are going, oh, it's not that if I had my recipe, I cook whatever. So I have this tamale and I'm thinking to myself, okay, you've been around the world. In Costa Rica, they make tamales with, uh, with potato. Okay, okay. And I'm thinking if I take, you know, a little bit of the cornmeal with a little flour and a little baking soda, maybe a touch of baking powder, I can get the texture. I am over here mad scientists on these tamales. You hear me? <laughs> and so I get that down. I go to get the husk. There's no husk. I'm like, oh my gosh. Now a normal person would let this recipe go and would try for something else. You know, while you're at the grocery store shopping. No. Nope. So here I am looking like a crazy woman shucking corn but you know, the corn hair is flying everywhere. So I've decided that I'm going to make my tamale in the fresh corn husk instead of a dry corn husk, which is what you normally would have made like Mexican style tamales out of. So um, it was a challenge and I was cooking all the way up until the doors were open. Here I am trying to make individual tamales. I let that go and said, okay, we're just gonna make a sheet tray. We're gonna form these tamales and do a deconstructed tamale with all the flavors. And it worked out great. Jose Andres said that I was the winner. There were a lot of people who absolutely loved it and it ended up turning into like a $40,000 tamale. 20,000 charity, 20,000 for the pocket. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, one, I want to point out that I said uh, Chris Borges before. It's Cristina Borges uh, from Ceará, which is in the north of Brazil. And um, she also mentioned, and this wasn't a question, just a comment. Um, she also loves the one pot recipes because you only wash one pot. <laughs> I'm with you, Cristina. In the restaurant, the rest of the guys wash all these dishes. <laughs> but at the house, one pot works for me. <laughs> I'm, we have a lot of questions, so I'm looking to... to have some that will cover a couple different things. Um, okay, one question. Um, when you travel outside the United States, like for the State Department or others, um, what, what ingredients do you miss most? It's not always ingredients. For instance, I was in India. Um, I went to India twice. And um, I miss just the flavors from home, right? So they had okra, but the okra was very differently cooked. Um, there was a lot of spice dishes, but they weren't spiced to what I, you know, the flavors that I like for spices. Um, I eat rice almost daily, but the rice was different, right? So it was basmati and not jasmine. And so um, oftentimes it's not an, in just one particular ingredient, but the style of cooking. I love braised meats with the little rice and green leafy vegetables or greens, um, green beans, <laughs> Brussels. I mean, all of those work for me, um, but something green and I need my rice and a little bit of meat that's been cooking with that sauce and I'm good. Thank you. One other question I wanted to ask about um, the, the terrible uh, snowstorm in Texas last month. Uh, we know just from, as uh, Douglas mentioned, Googling, we, you were all over the news helping your community. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did uh, when, uh, during the blackouts and the snowstorm in Texas? Yes, thank you. We had a very crazy time here. Um, and I think that it's important to understand that Texas is really large. So from city to city, the weather is very different. Um, I am more north, so we are closer to an area called Oklahoma, which gets a little bit of snow. Um, where my family is, um, they're very south, so they don't hardly ever get snow. And if they do, it's flurries, right? So Texas as a whole, we, we're not um, weathered for snow, so we don't really get too much. So 
our pipes and um, the way we're set up and the way we build um, houses and things here, we don't do it for snow. Um, when the snowstorm came, it was four inches of snow. Um, and then we had a day later, another snowstorm on top of that. Because of that, there were roofs caving in because water pipes were bursting. There was um, major issues with our power. So most of us didn't have power, myself included, the restaurant for a period of time as well. Um, a lot of people lost water or because of the pipes, um, the water situation was that way for almost a week. Some people were put on boil notice. Some people didn't have gas. So um, as I was sitting at home one night and I was just thinking about, hey, I'm in the dark, um, but you know, I have a gas stove. Most people you know, who live in different areas don't have gas, so they couldn't have a hot meal. So the moment that we could get the restaurant going, that night I made a post. I said, hey, if you want a hot meal, come to Roots Chicken Shack. We're gonna be serving hot food for you, no questions asked. Get as many plates as you need for your home, whatever the case may be. Now at the time, <laughs> I wasn't really sure how we were gonna pay for all this, but I figured we just needed to cook. We needed to do what we needed to do for our community. And at that time, people started saying, how can I help? Um, we had people just giving five, $10, $20. Um, and those small amounts of money added up to where we were able to feed over a thousand people. Um, in two days just by the money that was given and what we put in. But it became so well because we ended up having more people donating. Then we had businesses say, hey, we want to give to you the community as well. People from New York, you know, people from all over started sending dollars. We had vegetable donations that came in. We had another restaurant who lost some power and had a lot of vegetables and they just wanted to give it to us before they lost it. We cooked that and we were able to do it the following week as well. And so it was a beautiful moment to see so many of our neighbors, our community coming together to feed one another because it definitely wasn't a Tiffany thing or just you know the restaurant, it was a community thing. Without our community donating and without the donations, it wouldn't have happened the way that it did. And so it was just beautiful to see that once you make up in your mind, you want to do something, even if you don't have it figured out and you do it and everything else just seems to fit in place to allow you to do it. So it was a beautiful thing. That's, that's very inspirational. So thank you first. I just want to offer, I know it's hard to clap on uh, Zoom webinars, but I'm clapping for everybody. So thank you. Um, I think we're uh, running out of time. So I wanted to make sure that if Douglas has another question, please go ahead and, and answer and ask. I know we have many more, but uh, we are running low on time. No, 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 I, I'm not. Go on. <laughs> Um, I just want to say, you know, I've seen so many people reach out already on social media and I do my best to respond to everybody. Um, so thank you all for all of you just, you know, reaching out, becoming new friends. And, you know, my social media is MasterChef TV on Instagram. I have Facebook as well. And I love, you know, conversing with everyone. And I can't wait for the day that I can come and visit. And we're going to make that happen. So definitely try some new recipes. I'm going to be trying some new recipes from your area. And I think it can be a beautiful thing. <laughs> and um, the invitation is open. As soon as we can make that happen, you are welcome in Brazil, certainly in Rio de Janeiro. But I have a feeling all of my colleagues at the consulates and embassies here, embassy here in uh, Brazil, will uh, want to steal some of your time too. So We'll make thank, it work. <laughs> thank you so much. And Brazil's a wonderful place to visit, even if you're not working. So thank you very much. Um, okay. uh, Douglas, one, please. One question. Tiffany, uh, what Brazilian dishes have you have you tasted, you like, and uh, you don't like? Uh, please tell us. So I haven't had a lot. Um, feijoada is one that you find here. We have more a lot of the Brazilian like restaurants are more like the Brazilian state houses here. Um, so picanha, I love that. Um, and then uh, paujo, what's the cheese balls? The cheese. Uh, pao, pao, pao de queijo, the, yeah. Yeah. So the, the cheese bread. Yes. 
a lot of those. Pop one, pop two, pop three. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just, you know, so not a whole lot of dishes. I was telling Kevin that one of the dishes I want to try, what's the name of it? I care. With the coconut. I think, I think you said moqueca. That's it, moqueca. Mm -hmm. I, I want to try that so bad. And I'd love to try you guys' version sort of of the classic um, peas and rice or beans and rice, whatever you, you, you call it, because so many different areas of the world, all influenced by African cooking, um, all cook it just a little bit different. And I love from family to family how things can be so different. So I think I'll eat that every day. I do. That's the problem. <laughs> 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 Tiffany, thank you so much for making the time. This is wonderful. Um, again, the invitation is open to you to come visit whenever. Uh, mm -hmm. You may see me at, at one of your restaurants in Texas soon. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much. E obrigado para todos para, pela participação. Vocês vão receber um link para o receita por e-mail e uma mini pe pesquisa também para melhorar nossos programas no futuro. Muito obrigado a todos. Uh, o Douglas, uh, por to toda a participação e suas perguntas, e todo o time aqui no, no consulado, muito obrigado. And special thanks to Tiffany. Thank you so much for all your work with us. And thank you to everybody participating today. Tchau, tchau. Até breve. <laughs>